So thank you very much. And uh, now to our last uh, session, which is called Postmodernity and Liberty. And of course, if you were here last year at the same time of day, uh, you know that we had a session with the same speaker called Postmodernity and Liberty. It's not the time yet. Post postmodernity. That's right. It's not time war, it's that we are revisiting the subject with new ideas and so on, because what uh, Mark Henry Glendening is uh, proposing is a work in progress, so um, we'll discover what new insights he has in a topic that is generally not associated together. In other words, the word postmodernity and the words liberty are generally not conflated, certainly not in libertarian circles. And this is why I'm particularly interested, and I'm sure you will be, in knowing what uh, Mark Henry Glendon has uh, new to uh, offer. He'll talk for about uh, 20 minutes, and after that we'll have a drink reception, I think in the same place where we have our uh, uh, coffee breaks. So uh, you want to stay for this talk, uh, because you want to stay, and that will be because you want to stay for the drink to those of you who were subjected to this last year. Um, as, I said, as I said at the time, I, I felt that my, uh, my insights, such as they were, were rather sort of half-baked, and I'm not promising you by any means you know, a fully cooked version, but I'm hoping this will be kind of 60% cooked uh, rather than, than 50%. But it is a, a theme, I think, uh, that we should pursue. Um, Chris Tame and I, about four or five years ago, started to try to put some ideas together about how the left had mutated into a very different type of creature. And the sort of creature we felt was actually uh, more of a threat, in some respects, uh, to liberty uh, than the old uh, modernist rationalist <coughs> left. I think we were frustrated by the sort of Francis Fukuyama type end of history crowd. Um, the complacency of many on the centre-right, uh, who seemed to suggest that because the, the left had abandoned uh, the idea of a socialist planned economy or even a mixed economy with a very significant uh, public sector, uh, that somehow the left no longer posed a fundamental uh, threat to liberty. In our view, uh, was that, particularly in this country, it may differ in other countries, it'd be interesting to hear, uh, that our perceptions of collectivism and authoritarianism are very much shaped by 20th century uh, views uh, concerning uh, uh, socialism and what it means. And what I want to put forward is the idea uh, that we are now experiencing a postmodernist um, authoritarianism and a bit like those sort of turn-of-the-century French paintings made up of lots of little dots, you can only kind of appreciate uh, the full picture <coughs> if you step back uh, from, from what you're looking at. In exactly the same way, uh, postmodernists, or the postmodernists left, um, to use their own term, um, have no grand narrative. And this is why I think so many people uh, in the West do not perceive uh, the danger uh, that, that I do. I feel, because of this, slightly self-conscious even talking about a postmodernist authoritarianism, which for a lot of people in this country would seem uh, rather neurotic, uh, rather um, over-hysterical, uh, even putting to one side uh, for a moment the return of... Uh, the very deeply sinister Peter Mandelson, a.k.a. the Prince of Darkness, uh, back into our government. But certainly having heard Guy's brilliant talk about identity cards, I, I certainly feel a little less self-conscious uh, saying what I'm going to say. Uh, the reason I think libertarians have to take time out to try to get to grips intellectually uh, with what the, the, the left has become um, is that in the 70s and 80s, um, I think we were much more sick.
this means that they can do what they want with their bodies. As long as they don't harm other people. In Tennessee, it's amazing how much faith and how much store people put in government. So, for example, if two of our neighbours knocked on our doors,
propagandistic manner, uh, but was promoted really because it was ingrained uh, in the institutions uh, of civil uh, society. Uh, that set of human relationships outside of the state and the economic uh, base. And these institutions, churches, local community groups, uh, sporting associations, and what have you, would bring together people who, according to Marx's theory, uh, should have a deeply uh, antagonistic uh, economic uh, interests. Uh, and Gramsci believed that what Marxists were missing the point of was that individuals didn't lead uh, their lives entirely on the basis of, of economic class, and that there were these important cultural institutions uh, that would provide an overlap. And this, he thought, was one of the reasons that the, the Marxists were, making, were not making uh, tremendous headway in his uh, native um, Italy. And these ideas chimed particularly in the 60s and 70s, uh, with a new generation of left-wing activists, the vast majority of whom were university-educated uh, middle-class people, not exactly on the, the sort of front line, if you like, or the cold face of, of traditional economic activity, uh, people who were more interested in culture, really, than the economic base, and also people who were deeply frustrated by the failure of the working class uh, to do as um, Marxists had, had believed they would inevitably do and, and rise up and overthrow the capitalist system. The other key Gramscian idea is the notion of a broad-based alliance that would transcend class. And again, this chimed very much with the <coughs> desire on the part of a sort of metropolitan uh, new left uh, to reach out to those kind of new social movements, uh, feminism, black liberation, gay liberation, environmentalism, uh, and other uh, groups that were emerging um, in this period. And so what the left started to do from the 70s onward was to bestow victim status on a whole variety of new groups, uh, a victim status that up until that point they had only really uh, applied to the working uh, class. Uh, and they elasticated, if you like, if there is such a verb, the whole idea of oppression, of, of injustice, uh, and exploitation in order to be able uh, to reach out uh, to this multiplicity of new groups. And this is, I think, the, the sort of key uh, sort of point I want to make as to why uh, the new left is so dangerous. The other uh, key influence is the emergence of post-structuralist thought, uh, principally associated with uh, Jacques Derrida. Uh, and this posited the idea that there is a centre um, at the heart of every system, uh, be it God, be it the idea of the individual, be it the idea of the capitalist system, of the nation-state, um, sexuality to which everything refers and returns to. Uh, but all of these systems, according to the pro-structuralists, are in fact binary oppositions. Um, light and dark, the ruling and oppressed classes, the individual and the coercive state, men and women, whatever they happen to be. And these oppositions privilege one of the two oppositions. And Derrida goes on to say, and this is the part that would appeal to sort of third wave uh, new leftists. Um, but the point is not to transcend this strict binary division, uh, to reverse, if you like, the oppositions, uh, but in fact to totally erase the boundaries, uh, to overturn the entire order uh, that is being uh, discussed. And this is, of course, the whole idea of uh, deconstruction, um, whereby you collapse these oppositions by showing that they're not really true, um, exposing inherent uh, contradictions within them. And in the political t context I'm trying to relate this to, uh, this of course was a, was a very attractive idea to a new left, 
uh, that not only wanted to oppose the free market and capitalism on the one hand, uh, but also wanted to disassociate itself from East European style really existing socialism or uh, failing uh, Western uh, social uh, democracy. And it lent itself brilliantly, of course, to a highly opportunistic and flexible uh, political movement like uh, New Labour uh, in Britain, because it enabled the New Left to pursue what might be described as a sort of passive-aggressive type of strategy, whereby they could deconstruct, uh, to use the jargon, capitalism, the nation-state, conservatism, whatever was the, happened to be the focus of their attack, without ever clearly articulating what the alternative was, unlike the ideological, <coughs> to my mind, uh, relatively commendable old left, which had the courage uh, to say what was the alternative, what it actually uh, wanted to see. And of course, this whole sort of post-structuralist idea feeds in to the sort of new labor, new American Democratic Party sort of uh, tactic of triangulation, uh, so beloved of, of, of the likes of, sort of Bill Clinton uh, and Tony Blair. Now, it might um, seem fanciful uh, to think of the likes of John Prescott and Gordon Brown lying in their bath, uh, trying to get to grips with Gramsci, uh, let alone Derrida. It's not a thought I ask you to, to dwell on for too long. Um, and I'm not for one moment suggesting that all the Labour Party or their equivalent in other countries um, activists you know, going around obsessing uh, about how to apply Gramsci and Derrida and the Frankfurt School and all that sort of stuff uh, to, to everyday politics. But certainly these kind of ideas were, as a matter of empirical fact, sort of translated into political uh, reality, into a more humdrum political reality, uh, principally by the, the Euro communist wing of the British. Uh, Communist Party, as well as their equivalents in other, in other countries, uh, particularly uh, under the guidance of Martin Jakes, who is the editor of the highly influential Marxism Today magazine, Stuart Hall, who I've mentioned, and then a younger generation of new leftists like Charlie Ledbetter and Jeff Mulgan, who went on to work in the first New Labour administration after 97, then set up the, the Demos uh, think tank, which is still, uh, still with us and others, and they produced several sort of books, organized conferences that the, certainly the likes of Peter Mangles and Tony Blair and others attended and were very influenced by. This is the famous book on Thatcherism, which again really sort of hammered home the sort of Gramscian analysis as to why uh, the conservatives had been successful in creating their own broader um, uh, series of, of alliances getting into the traditional labor vote. Uh, and, and so that was um, an attempt to make the Labour Party realize that they could no longer rely on the old constituencies uh, that had sustained uh, social democracy in this country. And then uh, a book called New Times. New Times was the, the key kind of thesis of, the, of, the, of this post-modernizing uh, of, of the left and, and had a uh, major impact. And then it was taken up by Anthony Giddens, who's the sort of intellectual granddaddy of, the, of New Labour, with his book called The Third Way. Um, and I, I do, there should be a sort of public health warning here, because if you haven't read The Third Way, um, I really do suggest for the sake of your sanity that you resist the temptation, because it is actually rather like trying to get to grips with sort of General Gaddafi's little green book. Or, or, or Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf, uh, possibly those are also postmodernist texts. I mean, again, talking about there's no centre uh, to it, um, there's, there's no grand narrative. You're just reading this kind of, uh, this endless all kind of nonsense, uh, but very, in the case of Giddens, uh, sort of pretentiously uh, put together nonsense. I want to sort of move to a conclusion, really, by just giving a quick checklist um, of the ways in which I think the postmodern left can be differentiated uh, from, the modern, from its modern era predecessors 
social democracy and sort of other Marxism. Um, the first defining characteristic of the postmodern authoritarian is essentially epistemological. Uh, the abandonment of the idea that we can arrive at a total understanding of, of the society we live in. Um, the old left obviously believed that it was possible to arrive at this understanding that the, the working class uh, would, through their interaction uh, with the economic system and through the guidance of the Vanguard Party, would eventually come to see the full reality of their uh, position in relation to the, to the dominant uh, class and that they would then become, uh, obviously, the, the agent of, of a progressive historical um, change, whereas the postmodernists, of course, deny that society can be appreciated or understood as a uh, totality. Uh, and having abandoned revolutionary politics, the left went from essentially the optimistic belief on their part that the, the ideological and cultural superstructure uh, would then be replaced uh, by its socialist equivalent. Having lost that faith, uh, they then really went in for this much more negative, sort of scorched earth um, uh, approach of deconstructing all established uh, systems of thought, be they Christianity, <laughs> established scientific uh, beliefs, the literary canon, uh, you name it. Second and closely associated, closely related, um, PMA rejects the optimism of the European Enlightenment. Uh, has a fundamentally sort of negative and pessimistic uh, attitude towards humanity. Um, just as modern era leftists believed that law-like regularities uh, could be established in the realm of the natural world and could also then be applied to the realm of human um, activity, uh, the new left really now, through postmodernist theory, uh, denies uh, that this is possible. And so as a consequence, they have a very jaundiced, almost kind of 19th century conservative elitist um, approach to the masses. Um, and so, for example, we see the obsession of people like Polly Toynbee, writes for the, the Guardian, or the Labour politician, Dennis McShane, their obsession, for example, with the tabloid press and their repeated arguments that uh, people are made uh, racist by uh, reading the tabloid press, uh, the overtly sort of anti-democratic arguments we witnessed recently in relation to the issue of whether there should be a referendum in this country on the EU uh, Treaty of Lisbon. People like Dennis McShane saying very explicitly uh, oh, we, we can't have a referendum because uh, the Murdoch press uh, will, will fill the heads of the voters uh, with a lot of <coughs> arguments, as was the case in France and Holland and Ireland, and therefore um, this matter must not be uh, determined by the people. So you see, now the movement of the mainstream left into a very uh, anti-democratic approach, but it's, I think, one that's kind of fueled in part by a, funda a fundamental suspicion of, of ordinary uh, people, and I think this is maybe also be interesting to know, Guy's view, uh, as to, to why it is that New Labour is now so obsessive in terms of identity cards and a whole variety of, of other measures um, which are, are, are civil liberties violating. We also see an increasing uh, tendency to want to replace uh, the family um, as the main inculcator of values in children, so that, for example, we learn that even five-year-olds are now going to be subjected to compulsory relationship uh, training um, very soon, and in addition to the children's database, and a whole variety of other uh, state interventions um, into family life. Third, um, as I've intimated, this leads to the postmodern authoritarian adherence to, to undemocratic politics, and in particular, uh, their support for supranational uh, institutions such as the uh, European Union. Whereas the Euro European Enlightenment was about trying to make politics transparent as everything else, um, 
the aim of the new left seems to be very much to try to make the political process uh, extremely obscure, to obscure where real power actually lies. And so going back to our friend um, Professor Giddens, um, he says in the third way that he welcomes the arrival of what he calls cosmopolitan uh, democracy, in which the physical and legal borders between states will be, as he puts it, fuzzy. He says that the European Union model of government should be applied uh, to the whole world, and that the United Nations International Criminal Court's jurisdiction uh, will, quote, extend widely over relations between states and uh, their, their citizens. So supranationalism is also a major departure uh, from the old left, at least uh, in its social democratic uh, manifestations, uh, in terms of adherence to working within the structures um, of the nation state. And lastly is the inclination to extend state control and regulation uh, deep into the sphere of civil society and all types of uh, human relationship. And this, I think, is a clear and direct byproduct um, of the sort of identity politics, the fragmented uh, nature or alliance building, if you like, of, of the new left. And so, again, we have seen huge amounts of legislation relating to race, gender, uh, sexuality, uh, and so on, not just within the lifetime of this particular government, and in addition, a whole variety of measures to designed to limit uh, freedom of speech. I see, uh, sort of semi-amusingly, uh, that there is support now within, the, within New Labour, and certainly within the, the Liberal Democrats, probably the most inappropriately named political party in the world, <laughs> so clearly neither liberal nor actually democratic. Uh, they're actually politicians now pressing for legislation to ban the use of size zero models um, uh, on, on, on fashion shoots and in advertising campaigns. And I gather that the, the Spanish socialists have actually already uh, introduced such legislation. Um, I, I'm not one with any great uh, sympathy or, or love of the, of the fashion um, industry will be uh, surprised to learn. But I, I do think that the, the, um, the, the politics of this are actually quite mind-blowing, that they are one sort of semi-humorous indication of the way in which uh, the new left is now sees the culture and civil society as being its real focus rather than the economy. And lastly, I just want to put forward some challenges I think we as libertarians need uh, to face. Um, if it is accepted um, that there is a qualitatively different left, uh, then I think what we need to do is to impose, impose some sort of theoretical unity upon it in order for us to be able to convince others of the threat it poses to individual uh, liberty, uh, particularly uh, in the Western world. It's interesting to note that New Labour do not actually refer to themselves as anything. They certainly don't call themselves socialists, they don't even use the term social democrat. I did ask a friend of mine in the Labour Party, I said, well, what are you guys now? And he sort of said, well, I don't know. He said, I, I think we could call ourselves progressive. And again, you know, that's a deliciously vague um, sort of postmodern term which really can conjure up anything. So I think if they are not going to define themselves, um, we, we have to, to do it. Um, secondly, I think we have to be aware there's not just the new left that's the problem, unfortunately, where it's so simple. It's really almost the entire culture uh, now. Um, you only have to look at some television show like X Factor um, to see that everybody virtually in the society, other than possibly members of the libertarian alliance, but perhaps we'll start defining ourselves as a sort of victimized minority suit, <laughs> are now trying to um, define themselves as, as new <coughs> victims. Um, you even see the footballer Sol Campbell, who I think I last heard was on something like £100,000 a week, demanding police intervention at matches uh, to stop uh, supporters of rival clubs uh, making derogatory uh, uh, chants about him or alluding to his uh, sexuality. There's another footballer called David Kitson who plays for Stoke City, has red hair, 
and has demanded that um, the police intervene to stop uh, people making those sort of hairiest comments about <laughs> um, uh, So when you start seeing sort of people 100 grand a week or so, uh, saying that you know, their, their, their feelings have been so, so extraordinarily offended and there must be legislation, and the Football Association have been coming out and saying they would be sympathetic, uh, to a new, new law on sort of derogatory chanting, uh, then you kind of realise that there is something sort of deeply kind of sick and disturbing uh, about um, the culture we're living in. So libertarians, don't, it's not just a case of our overt political enemies, but the whole kind of new left victim culture ha has now spread right across the society. <coughs> Third, I think we also have to debate where we stand on the issue of the nation state. Uh, libertarianism, the universalist um, creed, um, has always been, I think, a sort of theoretical tension of the whole nation of the nation state, given that that is where uh, the potentially or often coercive state uh, tended uh, to be based. And as a consequence, some libertarians um, have been sympathetic to the idea of supranational government. I think that is a very theoretical uh, position, and I think for strategic reasons, uh, at this particular juncture in history, uh, we have to become uh, ardent defenders of the nation state in a Western context and try to do everything we can uh, to limit the flow of powers uh, to the European Union and beyond that to the uh, United Nations, which I think now has pretensions really uh, to becoming to becoming a state in its own right with the capacity to militarily intervene across the world, uh, to seize people and put them on trial in the Hague, and so on. And then lastly, and closely related to that, we also need to discuss the uh, where we stand in relation to democracy. Um, again, libertarians have been rightly suspicious of majoritarian democracy, seeing this as a way in which the state would often legitimise um, liberty violating measures. Indeed, of course, that, that can be the case. Uh, but in a context in which the new left is really doing everything it can to uh, emasculate those institutions that enable us as citizens to hold the sort of political class to some sort of accountability, it seems to me again. Uh, put it in a sort of Marxist way, rather sort of indisciplined, um, for us to be colluding um, with the um, emasculation of traditional parliamentary institutions. Uh, and I think we should open ourselves up to the, to the idea, really, of supporting direct democracy. Obviously, there will be times when we will be on the losing end, uh, but at least there will be a political arena that we can contest. We're on the losing end at the moment. Um, and in part, it's not just because we haven't won the war of ideas. It's not just because the culture appears to be uh, moving against us in many respects. But it's because there is simply no way of contesting, um, for example, identity cards. Um, if we had the sort of system the Swiss have some states in the United States, whereby we could actually try to force, say, a national referendum on identity cards, then at least we would have a chance. At the moment, um, we don't have a chance. And I see that, last parting shot here, that if the Treaty of Lisbon goes through, uh, the European Union, under that treaty, would get the right to um, impose identity cards. So even though the British government is clearly wanting to do this of its own volition, that treaty goes through, then even if we had an administration in the future uh, which wanted to reverse that policy, then potentially Brussels chose to act on that particular article. Uh, Guy will know more about this than me, but from my understanding of it, uh, then in fact it would be very difficult for an individual <coughs> nation state uh, that wanted to, to stop the the program uh, or to reverse it from doing that. And on that note, I will shut up. Thank you.
it's, um, we, we are running uh, a bit late, but I think uh, I don't want to let uh, Mark Henry go without uh, maybe two, three people contesting what he said, and uh, so that next year when we have this talk again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you for the interesting talk. Um, I'd like just to um, throw out another area which we should be worth looking at, which is this. Um, growing left and right um, agreement over the, what's called localism or devolution, uh, where you get a sort of central government power being pushed down to local government or taking health authority powers and pushing them down to the sort of local area, which strikes me as a, a, an area that has a lot of potential support for the people in this room, saying the people being affected by something should be the ones really deciding over it. And there seems to be the, a growing consensus on left and right nationally that this is a political direction we should go down into. Mm -hmm. However, um, there does also seem to be some worries about it, which is basically bringing the state into uh, much more um, sort of, uh, focus into more of our lives, much more sort of at a local level. We should have been to get. So perhaps that would be something you need to look at. Um, yes, it's, it, when you say this is um, I mean, I'm uncertain in my own head, maybe that others have thought about this more deeply, who, who would like to come in here and sort of rescue me. Um, on a strategic basis, um, I'm not entirely clear in my own head as to whether localism helps the fight for liberty or doesn't. I think it may depend on the issue. Um, I certainly think, when you say if this is a question of left and right, I certainly think the centre-right, in, in the form of the Conservative Party particularly, is interested in localism in part because of the sort of ideological vacuum at the heart of modern conservatism. And so in a way it's a kind of way of passing the buck by saying, well, we will allow, you know, uh, Northumberland, say, to determine how health services should be structured, uh, because I, I think they have uh, very little to say <coughs> as to how, what they would do, for example, if they got into power and found themselves in charge of health. So it's a way of kind of passing the buck, and I think it's sort of an indication of the, the way in which the centre-right feels or feels inhibited uh, about challenging the sort of orthodoxy that has been established, really, by New Labour. When you say the left is interested in decentralisation, I, I, I totally disagree with you. I, I can't see any manifestation of that. You occasionally get very vague speeches by people like David Miliband, but then this is part of all, also, again, this... Uh, post-modernist nonsense because they will make flowery speeches about decentralisation but then they will talk about the need to give more powers to, to, to the EU and, and uh, will be passing extraordinarily draconian uh, legislation and transferring power not just to institutions above the nation state but sideways to for example quangos uh, which are totally um, which is a way again of bypassing sort of parliamentary account, uh, accountability so I'm, I'm not certain that the centre-left, uh, there may be some people, to be fair, in the Liberal Democrats who, who genuinely in their own heads believe that they are local democratisers, but I certainly don't think you can identify any element of the, of, of the Labour Party that's serious, seriously wanting to do that. And I think the Conservatives are doing it for fundamentally uh, dishonest reasons. Tony Brown, then the gentleman in the back, and, and Guy, and Ben will stop there. I hope my question isn't too inchoate. Uh, could you keep everything short? Yeah, yeah. Yes, that's right. But what I was thinking as you were talking was that the deconstruction included the deconstruction of ideology, all ideology. Yes. Once you've deconstructed it, you are left with a void. You have to fill the void with something, so you fill it with a sort of technical managerialism. And the technical managerialism has to have an underlying philosophy, and it's the philosophy simply of expediency. So you sort of move from problem to problem in a very limited way, um, simply trying to address the problem. And you don't, and the whole problem is that you have voided yourself of any intellectual coherence whatsoever, and you cannot actually reconstruct it because of the process by which you got there. And the reason libertarianism... I think we're done. <laughs>
is we represent the only coherent yeah. alternative. Well, quite. Um, all, all I would say, you know, brilliantly put, and perhaps it'd be better if you just sort of come up here and said that rather than <laughs> waffling on for half an hour or whatever it was. Um, in relation to this, I'd, I'd simply sort of refer you, if you haven't already seen it, to, to an essay I just stumbled upon the other day on the net for the first time. A brilliant essay by, by George Orwell on managerialism. Uh, and particularly the, the thesis that James Byrne and the United States uh, put forward in the 1930s about the transition towards uh, a new class of, of, of technocrats. And Orwell is, is suggesting in that, so I think the essay was written towards the end of the Second World War, uh, that all the kind of nonsense paraphernalia, if you like, that went along with, with fascism and communism uh, would eventually sort of dissipate and that the ruling technocratic elites of both uh, of the Western countries, uh, the East European countries, uh, they would eventually kind of merge really into one sort of technocratic, uh, again, supranational uh, <coughs> ruling, ruling class. It's a brilliant essay which is kind of way ahead of its time and mm -hmm. prophesizes a lot of things. So, yeah. yeah. Gentlemen there with uh, glasses, that's right. And uh, make it very short, you then guy, and then we um, stop for drinks. Uh, I was somewhat surprised that you didn't pick up on the fact that one of the principal things that Orwell was saying was that the message. I was actually advised by my local sergeant at my sacred neighborhood panel, which I just happened to be the chairman of, not the chair of the body, that we couldn't have it if it wasn't measurable. It didn't matter how much support there was, it didn't matter how much call there was for it. If it wasn't measurable and we couldn't tick the boxes, then we couldn't have that as a choice mm -hmm. in terms of our priorities. That. The same thing is happening in local governments in terms of livability, uh, targets, goals, same in health. You only get it if you actually meet the prescription and you are going to be on that. Okay. Yep. Managerialism, again, I think that's a sort of manifestation of it, and that is actually possibly a contribution uh, that the Conservatives made. Really, I mean, back in the 80s, trying to sort of introduce a lot of the disciplines uh, of, of, you know, big private sector uh, bureaucracies, as it were, into the, into the state bureaucracy. And so we've now got this sort of nightmarish kind of, kind of melange of um, hyperactivity. Encourage what it has done has been to encourage hyperactivity uh, within the bureaucratic uh, class, at least in the past, the old style. Um, Good old style, sort of laborist, social democratic institutions. Uh, the bureaucrats had no interest really in doing anything other than sort of going home early. Uh, and now, the great horrors, and this is why you know, now it's far worse, is that bureaucrats are subject to all these kind of uh, targets, just like you know people who work for Sainsbury's or something. So they have to be hyperactive. So they have to come up with more and more sort of regulations to justify their existences or, or to, 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 to get a pay right. So it's actually got the most, worst of both worlds. We were burgeoning bureaucracy, I mean, extraordinarily inflated since New Labour came to power. But they're all actually doing stuff. That's the really bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Mark, in the course of his speech, asked a question. Uh, we'll take it in the next Um, there are there are two sadly <coughs> answers to that. One of which is mine, and one of which uh, belongs to the uh, post-Marxist sort of the spike the Marxism uh, history of ideas school. My answer is it's to do with the annihilation of trust, whereby individuals are no longer uh, conceived of as, as having. Uh, Capability to evaluate their chances uh, uh, autonomously. And the spike, uh, the Marxism answer, is it's to do with the fearfulness of the authorities and the fact that they are distant and they wish to uh, present themselves as being close to us and connected with us. Mm. Um, so, so, 
two answers to that question. One more point, which is uh, to, to add to your shopping list. There may be no central grand narrative to all this, but there is a consistent set of narratological techniques that are in use, and specifically one that is at the core of the, all, all the, the sales technique of New Labour and the New Left, which is to present all counter-argument as interested, and all uh, the uh, arguments for the new authoritarians as caring and disinterested. Yeah, and this is all part of the kind of, obviously, the, the tactics of, of spin that we have become so familiar with. But spin often of a, of a rather sort of sinister type, which I think you indicate, whereby if people oppose what you're doing, uh, they have some, some sort of vested interest, uh, not some genuine morally derived uh, opposition, but actually some sort of sinister agenda. So, for example, on the whole issue of climate change, um, anybody who uh, raises an oppositional voice is often lambasted as being in the pay of you know, big corporations or, you know, or having some sort of, uh, sort of sinister interest. Uh, there were examples of New Labour trying to dig up um, dirt on, for example, an elderly woman who complained about her treatment under the N N NHS and they were going around trying to get the doctors and nurses, to, to, you know, they were trying to find out if she had said anything racist about the staff. Uh, and, and that sort of thing. So there is something very sort of sinister. And of course, you know, our, our dear friend, the, the Duke of Hartlepool, uh, of course, has perfected uh, these sort of techniques. And I dare say that in the context of the American presidential election, uh, that those sort of things, uh, are, as we know, are, are also uh, being used there. But there has been a, a qualitative change in the way that political debate, if you can call it that, given the ideological void. Uh, we're in, uh, has, has taken place, uh, or, or does take place, and again, triangulation is, you know, is a classic example, but I do think all of these things, uh, call me an obsessive if you must, do actually have at their root the sort of post-modernising uh, of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the, political, the political environment uh, in, in a way that didn't happen in the modern era, where people, generally speaking, tried to persuade you that their ideology was better than other ideologies, uh, that there was a, you know, a genuine contestation of ideas and people actually trying to positively sell you uh, socialism or libertarianism or, or, or whatever it happened to be. Uh, that is simply not the case now. Uh, you know, it, it, we are kind of living through a strange sort of political purgatory, I think. Well, this puts <coughs> an end to uh, this conference on a high note. And uh, I must say that to me, it's been a fantastic two days. I enjoyed every minute of it. I think we had very powerful speakers. I think we had a wonderful audience. And uh, I would like to uh, thank, and I would like you all to thank uh, Sean, uh, who has been uh, the... Uh, uh, <laughs> I think we all wish her uh, a very prompt uh, recovery. So for Tim and Helen, who are not here, but will be following this on a video, again, I would ask you to... <laughs> we'll be meeting uh, next year in the same place for another great conference, and we are going to celebrate this one with Prince in uh, the room next door. Thank you all, see you next year, and maybe...